Hey, everybody. Hold on just a second. Whew. All right, all right. Busy as a bee today. When the cat is away, the mice will play. And the cat is the old ball and chain. Old Charlotte is not with us this evening. Neither are my daughters. They're in Philadelphia uh, going back to where we live in South Jersey and to scope out some schools for old Chloe Gray. So uh, uh, they're not with us uh, today. So uh, it was a good day. Got a lot done out in the garden. Put some stuff together for weight equipment. These little jumping things you can jump on because uh, apparently jumping is a good exercise. I'm telling you, try doing some jumping. Man, it's nuts. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's make sure, like Kim says, to monetize this thing. Hold on just a second. Got some uh, some good stuff today. I, I've i been thinking about this for a couple of days now. It looks like I got some, uh, some sun on my pale face, doesn't it? All right, all right. Looks like I got some sun. On the old pale skin, and when you got uh, when you got some sun on your pale skin, it makes your teeth look whiter. So, all right, all right. Hold on just a second. All right, all right, cool. All right, there we go. Let's make sure we get that sweet, sweet YouTube money. Sweet, sweet YouTube money. And what I'm gonna try to do, I'm gonna see if I can't bring. Uh, Oh man, I bring it. Oh, shoot. I'm going to see if I, I'm going to try. Hmm. How am I going to do this? I was hoping to get on that uh, whiteboard back there. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to do this. I'll think about it. Hold on just a second. Um, probably bring it closer. Yeah, maybe I'll bring it closer. Yeah, we'll think about that. Um, I guess I could use that little one. Yeah. I don't know how am I going to do that, actually. Uh, we might not need that. We'll see. All right. Hold on just a second. All right, cool. Let's go. All right. Uh, the simultaneous sip or whatever that guy, Scott Adams' name is. I don't know if you follow my man Anomaly, but he uh, did a uh, video where Fauci was destroyed by some Mexican actor who's got you know thousand millions of uh, supporters in Mexico. And apparently, Fauci was this is like the first guy that actually gave uh, Fauci uh, a run, you know, because Fauci's look, everyone's just sweating him, you know what I'm saying? So this is like the first guy who actually said, uh, "Excuse me, excuse me, there, Fauci." He didn't call him Fauci. He was very nice. Because yeah, and Fauci had nothing, no response. It was nuts. It was nuts. And Fauci looked like the fool he is, a squirmy little fool. It was, it was fantastic. So watch my man Anomaly. And I don't know what the guy's name, the Mexican actor who interviewed Fauci, but apparently he just freaking tore him up in a very the best way, which isn't which isn't hostile, which isn't anger. It's just like, dude, you're freaking lying, piece of excrement. You know you're lying, piece of excrement, and we just caught you time and again. It was fantastic because. Uh, I'm sure Fauci went in there and said, ah, man, I'll just go in there and, you know, all these kids, you know, Mexicans, Mexicanos, they'll just, you know, listen to old Fauci. They won't have, they won't throw any, you know, freaking shade at me like the mainstream media does it because the mainstream media just sweats me like I'm freaking the, you know, the second coming of St. George. And they're going to say, and then this Mexican actor said, hell's no, Fauci. And he called him out. And I mean, it wasn't even called him out like, you're lying. It was just like saying, well, uh, is this true? And Fauci said, yeah, yeah. He goes, okay, because the FDA said this is literally not true. What you're saying is a lie. Fauci said, well, I mean, give it. And it was, it was, it was fantastic. There's hope. There is hope. The fraudsters are being caught. I'm telling you, there's hope. Cuomo, that, that sex harassment stuff is horrible. Don't get me, I don't make light of that, but I think it's a little bit worse when you're killing 10,000 people. So I'm, it's coming. The uh, the day of reckoning is coming, and there's nothing that can stop it, other than you know silly prosecutors who are elected by the left wing. But even there, they they want their piece of meat too. I mean, this is what's happened in New York. Remember, the whole thing with freaking Cuomo came because the Attorney General in New York wants his job, man. The Attorney General in New York's like, man, Cuomo, I want your job. I'm you think you're left wing? I'm crazy left wing, and it's great. And so we're seeing the uh, the recall gruesome. That's got what 2.2 million votes now. You know, signatures that should go through whether or not he actually gets recalled hard to say but that i would imagine gruesome is not very liked in the state of california 
who knows what will replace him. Hopefully not a freaking Schwarzenegger type. I don't know who's going to replace him, though. But be it as it may, uh, these guys need to have to come up. And so Gruesome and Cuomo are both gone, which is nuts. Because if you would ask me in 2024, I would have thought either of those guys would probably win against uh, – Whoever's running on the Republican Party, I would have thought Gruesome and or Cuomo would be the shoe in, frankly. Yeah, there's no way Kamala. I mean, Kamala now because she's vice president, but I mean, she's just she's lightweight, man. I mean, Biden is lightweight, but I would have thought for sure Gruesome and Cuomo would have been a uh, top ticket because California, New York, man, my goodness, their days are gone, which is, I mean, we think, we think until they're gone, <laughs> they're not gone, but uh, most likely they're going to be gone, uh, at least from national politics, at least Cuomo. That's good. Uh, Gruesome actually had some common sense in some things with the high speed rail. Uh, that was that made sense. He said, We're not going to spend any more money on that. I think the stupid COVID budget threw some money at that, which is crazy. Might I think, or is it some budget in the federal government? Uh, so that's good. So lots, and then, um, they're going to recall that stupid, crazy prosecutor, district attorney in uh, LA County. The Soros guy looks like he's under a recall, so all good, man. So, uh, there, there is some good stuff coming down the pike, that's for sure. All right. Hey, Canyon Lake. That was right, Paul. All right, man. I've been to Canyon Lake a couple times. That's right north of South of uh, Bernie. So right on. All right, so let's uh, let's go into this, man. No, oh, really? With my man uh, Austin Foreman, Eric. I love Austin Foreman. He's the guy who wrote that song. Is he coming here? He freaking huge fan. Yeah, my my uh, wife is in uh, when she went to South Jersey Haddonfield. Is, uh, she, a lot of the restaurants we used to frequent are closed, but she said it was pretty busy. But they went to a uh, there's some English place uh, fish and chips and stuff that we. Used to, I, I don't know if we ever went there, but it was been there for a long time. It's still it's not. It's 25 percent capacity because if you're 26 percent capacity, COVID gets mad. But if you're 24 percent, you're fine. 26% capacity. Oh, science, science. It better be quiet because uh, YouTube will spank me down for medical misinformation um, because my man Young Rip uh, got spanked down twice, uh, Eric July, but he was able to to fight back in the one, so that's good. Um, don't say bye-bye to that clown's gone, though. I tell you, man, don't say bye-bye yet. Um, link for what? Link for what? Yeah. All right. All right, so you guys are asking me about uh, – Anomaly. All right, let me find him real quick. Yes, we will find them, and then we'll get into my uh, my thing here. So we're going to go to YouTube. Oh, I love Anomaly. Now, Jill, <laughs> I'm telling you, be advised. Anomaly is a uh, – is uh, he's the guy who says the biggest proponent of the vax was Donald Trump. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Anomaly. Um, um and hip hop. One sec. Yeah, there we go. So uh, just be advised. Uh, Anomaly is not. Uh, well, he he and I both supported Trump. He is not a a Trump girl, a Trumpster uh, that some might which think he would be, if that makes sense. So here is Anomaly and hip hop, and right here. Fauci grilled by Mexican actor Eugenio Derbez in a better interview. Uh, this is just fantastic. This is just fantastic. And I, I love Anomaly. Um, this guy is fantastic. Um, anyway, so Dr. Fauci grilled by Mexican actor Eugenio Derbez in a better interview than any media yet. Now, I'm not on Facebook, but Anomaly's got tons of, I, I think he had like a million followers on Facebook. So I highly recommend you uh, subscribe to his channel. I'll put the link if I can find this in the show notes because uh, this guy's he's he's freaking awesome, man. I love that. It's weird how many young uh, new guys are coming down the pike to really kick butt and take names. I, I'm we got so many young guys that are doing good stuff, man. That I I uh, I, I uh, I'm I'm stoked, man. So many young guys. It's uh, it's fantastic. And uh, you know, YouTube, as much as they drive us crazy, they're giving them a platform. And so I sit there and I say, I don't know. Sometimes I get disappointed in the young, and sometimes I'm feeling pretty excited. I guess it depends on my level of feeling for that day. But all right, we'll put that on the side for now. Um, anyway, so uh, 
Yeah. All right. John says, go to the uh, the YouTube and see the actual interview. Fantastic. Yep. Right on, man. I, I just freaking thousand. Okay. The links for the anomaly video and the ballots in Georgia found. Oh, but I don't know the ballots for Georgia. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. But anyway, uh, Fauci just, I this things are starting to work, and this is good stuff. Look, man, you just got to get these guys to be held accountable. And I was just listening right now to Viva Frey in uh, Barnes, you know, just right before we started this. Did you know Cuomo made the freaking nursing homes not liable? They have exemptions, ex immunity from lawsuits. So Cuomo can force you to go to a nursing home. You go to a nursing home. And something bad happens to you, and you can't sue Cuomo, and you can't sue freaking the nursing home. And you can't, then if you get the COVID and it freaking puts a third eye in you, you can't sue the freaking pharma. This isn't freedom. This is nuts. Cuomo made the nursing homes immune from lawsuits. I, I'm literally sitting there as I, and I have a good friend of mine, Skip, you know Skip, Skip Ritchie. He's been on my YouTube channel, and he does a lot of Medicare and Social Security stuff for disability. And he's, you know, a trial lawyer, you know, but ambulance chaser. He admits it. Now I said, man, but I'm telling you, Skip tells me some of the stuff that some of these corporations do, but it's not just corporations. He goes, you hate us until you need us. I said, you know, you're right. I can't believe it, man. I'm saying, wait a second. How come all these people are exempt from lawsuits? We're, you know, I guess you need a, in this case, you need a freaking an ambulance chaser because no one else is going to hold these people accountable. It's nuts. Anyway, it's nuts. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty I'm, it's, uh, seems like things are starting to happen. It's good. All right. So I want to go into, um, the 4% rule. All right. So Kim is another Kim asked, what is the 4% right, right here? Kim says she appreciates life. All right. Kim appreciate life. All right. So Kim, the 4% rule is the, uh, is the old rule that came out in financial planning back in, uh, 19, it wasn't, it didn't really get traction until about 1998 or so. But basically, the rule of thumb previously would be you could get 10% a year in the stock market, which meant you could take 8% a year from your portfolio and still add to your capital. If you take our trusty thing here, um, our whiteboard, you say, all right, so if I'm making 10 and I'm withdrawing 8, I'm still putting 2% a year each and every year into the portfolio. That was, and that's just silly because that's not how it works. How how the how the markets work, and this is what Bill Bengen, his whole article is premised on, is the markets go up and down like this. And when sometimes you're taking out money right here, and you're like, woohoo! Sometimes you're taking out money right here, you're like, oh no! And the issue is, if you start your retirement, for instance, in 1973 and 1974, when the market fell about 45 percent in total. Uh, you, you, and you're taking 8% a year out, you're doomed, doomed, I'm telling you. And that's not good. So I'm going to share with you the article that uh, started all this, which I, I appreciate. I'm not, I am not in any way here to bash Bill Bangett. I could not be happier with a guy. Um, but I think there's a big issue with this. And here it is, the determining uh, historical withdrawal rates using historical data. And that's how uh, young chaps used to look in the early 90s. Big glasses. Um, it's just funny how, uh, how things change. We're kind of going, my wife's got some big glasses. And I said, dude, don't, don't ever get, they're not quite Hillary Clinton glasses if you've seen the Hillary Clinton glasses when she was in college. But man alive. I said, what happened to the tiny glasses? Now I got LASIK. I tell my wife, just get LASIK for heaven's sake. She goes, I'm scared, I'm scared. And I said, wait till the zombies come, man. You're not going to be scared. When the zombies come, if they can't find your glasses, that's what I always say. The number one prep item is having good eyesight. All right. So anyway, the um, what does I want to kind of uh, – okay, right here. Uh, hold on just a second. All right. Uh, the logical fallacy that got our hypothetical planner into trouble is assuming that average rates of return and average inflation rates are sound basis for computing how much a client can save for withdrawal. As Larry Beerworth, I never, I'm not, I'm not familiar with him, uh, pointed out in his excellent article, blah, 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 uh, it pays to look not just at averages, but what actually has happened year by year to invest in returns and inflation. Uh, he demonstrated the long term effects of certain financial catastrophes, such as the Depression or 1973 and 74 recession, can overwhelm the averages. Such events cannot be ignored, and the client should be made aware of them. So basically, what he did is he said, okay, what if we took, um, 
Here we got our big bang in 1973-74. Uh, the total return on common stocks was down 37%. Uh, and the total return on intermediate bonds, government bonds, 10 year, basically 10 year bonds was 10.6 and their change in inflation is 22.1. So after inflation, uh, you, you're down 59% with stocks. Not only did you lose 37%, but you lost 22% to inflation as well. You're not taking 8% a year off that and going to survive. Uh, he calls a big dipper. What happened the second, the, kind of like the, uh, the aftermath of the initial hit of the Great Depression. Uh, the market was down 33% with a 10 half percent inflation. That's a total of 45 roughly. Uh, but then we talk about the, um, the, the 1929 to 1931. I think it's actually 1927. Anyway, he talks uh, 61%. The market was down, but a deflation of 15.8%. So even though all the market historical data has these things thrown in, on average, it gives us 10% rate of return. But that that's you're not getting 10% each and every year. Some years you're down 30%. Some, you know, it's a time frame from 19, uh, October 2007 to March 9th of 2009, you were down 54%. And so you can't just say, well, the historical average of the market has been eight. So I'm, I mean, been 10, so I'm gonna take eight and be safe. It doesn't work like that. So basically what Bill said, and I've never met the guy, I, I, just, I like him, I'm a fan of him. I know it sounds like a bash the guy, I'm not, absolutely the first thing. He said, well, if you only took 3% a year out, and you had a 50-50 portfolio. Oh, it's tonight daylight savings time? Oof, I don't know. Uh, that's why we got to live in Indiana and Arizona, right, Indiana, Joe? You don't do daylight savings, savings time? Anyway, he said if your first year withdrawal was 3%, you never ran out of money. All right, number of years your portfolio will last uh, withdrawals. And if you start in 1926, 1928, he does these rolling 30 years of time frame. If you only took 30% out, 3% a year out on a 50 50 portfolio, 50% intermediate treasury bonds, 10 year treasuries, all right, and 50% in the SP 500, you never ran out of money. Now, we're going to dive back into this in more detail because this misses something significant, I think. Uh, what if you did 4%? Well, you ran out of money right here uh, in year 39. So if you started retirement in 1936, you ran out of money in year 39, but we're trying to shoot for 30 years because no one's living 39 years. Here you ran out of money if you started 1966 at uh, year, let's say about 31, I think is what it was. So if you were taking 4% a year out each and every year, adjusted for inflation, the worst case scenario is your money, your money ran out in, uh, in one time in 1966 when you started retirement 31 years later. So you're fine. Uh, and then we go, I think he did a 5% one. Yeah, so here we got 5%. You can see the 66 right here to 82 time frames was tough. Um, here your money ran out uh, before five, uh, 20 years are over. So this is this is, this is is bad. I mean, so here we got, look at that, because high inflation. Boom, 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 boom. You're getting, you're getting hammered. And that's not good. So oh, that's a 6%, excuse me. Here's 5%. All right, so 6%, you know, you're, you're in a world of hurt. Here, I mean, these years, here's 5%. So 5%, other than 1966, your money lasted over 20 years each and every time with a 5% withdrawal adjusted for inflation. So that's the basis of the uh, the uh, um, the 4% the four rule. Now, uh, initial asset allocation. All right, so I want to show you something. Uh, the client continually rebalance a portfolio of 50% common stocks and 50% intermediate treasuries. Huh. Hmm. 50% common stocks, S&P 500, and 50% intermediate treasuries. Hmm. Hmm. That's what we're going to talk about. All right. So part two of this is we go to the uh, the Trinity study, which kind of came out a little bit later, like three or four years later. And I'm going to share that with you, um, which add a little more juice to it, a little bit more uh, diversification, a little bit more um, uh, they small caps, uh, a different type of corporate bonds and stuff like that. And it gives about 4.4 percent with the Trinity study when all said and done. And so everyone in financial planning uses these studies as if, uh, you know, I mean, I, Bangin doesn't do it, but it's the financial planners who are lazy, a lazy bunch. They use these studies to say, now just watch a guy today. Oh, my God. There's so much bad financial advice on YouTube, man. I, I, it's just nuts. It's, I watch these videos. I just, I cringe. I, and I, I can't call these people out. I, I wish I could. I can't. 
I'm just like, dude, you're freaking wrong, man. You're, you're, you're just, your numbers are so wrong. It's, it's insane. And I just, uh, <sighs> anyway, so we got, um, you can see here a 50, 50 stock to bond. They're using corporate bonds. They're using some small caps, and whatnot, uh, 30 years, a 50, 50 stock to bond. Uh, if you took out 4% a year, your money lasted, hundred percent of the time. If you took out five percent a year, it lasted a hundred percent of the time. If you took out six percent a year, it lasted ninety-eight percent of the time. And so the Trinity study says you could take your four percent a year out every be a hundred percent stocks. Uh ninety-eight percent of the time the money lasted. I mean, you, you can just see all this. They're just basically saying you took five percent a year out. It didn't last all the time, but it pretty came pretty dog close, but not all the time. But anyway, the point being you could take out 50-50. 100% stocks, I mean, a 50-50 stock to bond and your money did not uh, run out um, 30 years, it's, which that kind of goes back to the 4.4 uh, model here. All right. So but what Trinity does is they're going to use this is a pretty good article here by uh, Physician Finance Basics. Um, uh, let's see. They But the Trinity study, we're using CPI to determine inflation. Uh, I had a guy tell me uh, about inflation. <laughs> A guy told me on my man Jason, uh, uh, Fighting Words Financial blog post of uh, YouTube channel. It wasn't Jason, it was a guy on his channel said, We've lost 36% of our purchasing power in the last four years because government debt went up by 36%. <sighs> like, okay. Um, anyway, so what they're saying here is uh, these guys are using uh, corporate bonds. Yeah, using high grade corporate bonds for the bond allocation. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So what we're going to do is I want to share with you something. I hope that makes sense. I hope you guys are following um, this, this Trinity study stuff and the 4% rule. Um, that, that'd be, be fantastic. So what we're going to do. Um, yeah. I, I, I uh, Eugene says, can I explain the rich man's Roth that Doug Andrews talks about? I don't know who Doug Andrews is. I think it's the guy, a life insurance guy. There's a, there's two guys lately on my feeds that are, one's a life insurance guy, and one's offering Roth conversions where you get these huge tax credits and huge deductions. And a couple of you all had talked to this guy, and I'm like, man, that that, that ain't going to fly, man. I just – and if, I think Doug Andrews is the guy with the – the uh, the what's it called? The laser or something like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say anything because I'm trying to be positive here. Um, all right, so they uh, let's see. I want to show you my concern, Frank. Where do I want to start here? Okay, so the first thing we have to do is go back to banging. He's using 10-year Treasury bonds is what he's using. All right, goes back to 1926. What happens when you buy a 10-year Treasury bond? What happens when you buy a 10-year Treasury bond? And what banging is doing is he's – and all people doing this historical. How do you get money out of a 10-year trade? I need you to answer this because there was no bond mutual funds in 1926. There was none, 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 none. There wasn't any. In fact, the first real stock mutual fund was MFS, and then Wellington came around and a few others in the late night, in the late 20s. But other than that, there's there was nothing. And those cost pretty expensive money. But either way, I mean, I don't know about Wellington, but the other ones did. But there's no bond mutual fund. So how do you buy a bond and get money out of it? All right. Think about that, because this is critically important. If you can't buy a bond mutual fund, how do you buy intermediate government bonds, 10 year treasuries and get money out of it? There is only one way. That's it. Well, there's two ways. And we're going to go into both these right now. So the first way and I've used this a million times a Sunday. Look at my man, John. You've got you have two options. You have to sell it. Or you take the interest. Now, I'm going to share this with you because it's, once you get it, you'll say, that makes sense. That makes sense. You have a bond that is issued at 100 bucks. A bond matures at 100 bucks. It's literally that simple. A bond is issued at 100 bucks. A bond matures at 100 bucks. There is no two ways around this. So we're going to say a 10-year treasury bond. It, 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 it issues at 100. You loan the government 100 bucks, and they're going to pay you 100 bucks back. After 10 years, in the interim, they're going to give you a coupon every year. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go into our trusty spreadsheets because is there anything better than spreadsheets? 
it's funny how many people who are engineer types say uh, they hire me. They said, I got all these spreadsheets. I said, I trust me. I know. I know you do. <laughs> I know you got spreadsheets. So we're going to my man, Daniel Kuhlberg's uh, uh, bucket strategy script here. And uh, 55e.co to get your own. And look, I don't get paid on this. I just love his stuff. And I uh, want him rewarded as much as I possibly can because it's freaking fantastic. So let me go and just show you how you can get your own spreadsheets of this to crunch your own numbers uh, right here. We're going to go to here. And we're going to go to. Man, I made some uh, ribeye tonight. Oh, man. Oh, man. Some grass fed ribeye. Oh, that's another thing real quick. I did a video earlier on how to watch. You know, you got to lose weight, man. You got to lose weight. Uh, stop eating freaking corn fed beef, man. Get some grass fed. It's better for you. It might cost more, but it's going to it taste better. It's going to be better for you. Get the grass fed stuff. You know, get through a CSA, uh, get through your little, you can buy half a pig, I mean, half a freaking cow, whatever you want to do. I use, I started uh, using porterroad.com a lot lately. Big fan. Now they got a couple guys around here, um, but I, I kind of don't like all the other stuff that goes with the, if you buy a half or a quarter cow, I, I don't like all the other stuff they throw in there. So I'm like, eh. I just like the, the I just like the cuts. I just like the steaks. Anyway, um, you got to get the grass fed stuff. It's better. It's better for you as well. It just is. And when you're fat, talking about our our lack of a good immune system, I'm telling you, eating all this corn is not good. And I, I don't mean corn like oh my goodness, but it's all the freaking corn and everything, man. It's it's just not good because it's all just mass produced and mass consumed, and that's not good for you or individual body. All right, so here's my man uh, Daniel Coolbert's 55 Elements. I'm going to use this bucket, this strategy right here, this web, uh, his uh, um, spreadsheet, and you can buy it too. I think he's charging 25. Yeah, so I'm starting the price off at 20. He started off at 25, 25, 25, 26, 26. Uh, he started 25 bucks, man. And uh, if you don't get it, you're, uh, you're, you're making a mistake. I'm just telling you because it's the best spreadsheet for what we're going to do here. But I mean, nothing else comes close. I'm just telling you right now. All right. So let's go back to what we're going to do here. So, oops, we're going back to Daniel's uh, spreadsheet. All right. All right. All right. Don't forget to hit the like button if you can. Like button. All right. So we'll go back here. All right. Cool. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Daniel's spreadsheet. And I got two things going on here. I got the 10 year treasury and the one month U.S. treasury. And we're going to go back to 1926. All right. So the 10 year treasury. Right there. All right. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of things. And we're going to start just with a 10-year treasury. This will make sense in just a second. All right. So here's a 10-year treasury, 3.7. All right. So in 1926, you bought the 10-year treasury and you got 3.7%. So 3.7 was the yield. All right. So bear with me just a second. We're going to come here. We're going to stop this. We're going to go here. All right, so every year I'm getting 3.7% for 10 years. Every year. Uh, just do it like this. Point, point, point. So assume that's 10 years. I mean, assume this. So on 100,000 bucks, that's 3,700 bucks a year. 3,700 bucks a year. Every year I'm getting 3,700 bucks a year. No more, no less. You with me so far? I cannot get more unless I sell the bond. If I sell it, I can get more, and we're going to why that's that's impossible. I mean, so you can do it, but it's not part of these guys' return methodologies. I can't. I can only get three point seven. In fact, that's you will get that because they don't reinvest in bonds either. I just I, this is another thing that's pet peeve of mine. You, bonds are not compounding. You what you get is what you get. Three point seven. So for every hundred thousand bucks, you're only getting three thousand seven hundred bucks. That's good or bad. It, it's irrelevant. It's not. 100,000, if I reinvest it back in the bond, I get 103,700 that gets compounded on top. It doesn't work like that. Bonds, they just pay you a fixed income. This is a fixed income. And you get a fixed amount of maturity, assuming the bond doesn't go back bankrupt. That's it, man. So every year I get 3,700 bucks. I can't reinvest it. I am getting 3,700 bucks. There's no other way around that. All right, so I'm going to spend it. We're just going to assume I'm going to spend it. You with me so far? All right, so I'm going to assume I'm going to spend that 3,700 bucks. Now, Let's go back to the, well, I, and it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just going to, it, it cannot be reinvested, but I can't get more. I can't get less. All right. So what happens then? So 1926, which is actually, is going to be a good time to start this because we had deflation. And what you're going to see here, if we go to, we're going to use 
four percent a year. Yeah, that's gonna be tough. Well, let's just use let's use four percent a year. Um, and we're gonna adjust it for inflation. So remember, we're using a four percent rule. I need four thousand each and every year. I'm gonna adjust it for inflation. So the first year I need four thousand, but I'm only getting thirty seven hundred dollars from my bonds. So inherently, I have to take some money out of stocks. The fifty percent in the S and P five hundred. I'm not going to mess with that here right now, but I'm just I'm just telling you. Now the next year we had deflation, 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 deflation. So by the time uh, 1933 rolls around, I only need 2972. So my bond is actually paying me more than what I need, which is pretty cool, right? Because we had deflation, so I'm getting $3,700, but my bond is paying me. Uh, my, is pay, my, I mean, I need 2972, but my bond is paying me 3,700 bucks. That's good. So the first year, I didn't have enough for my bonds. Uh, my second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, I didn't have enough, but I had enough for my bonds from the interest I was getting off my bonds the last uh, right here until it matured. All right. So in 1935, that 10 year treasury matured. Are you with me so far? Let me just double. I got to get a, a check here because I'm telling you, this is critical, critical. So let's just make sure we get a check here. Everybody with me so far? So I'm so my bond essentially because deflation is uh how come I can't get this thing to move? Hey man, what's up? It goes that way. Okay. Okay. All right. So all right. I guess. So just remember, all right, check on learning. Right on, Jeremy. And uh, I saw the picture of old Jeremy from Maine. Woo, we ladies. Got a good looking young man up in Maine who works for the uh, the power company. So he knows he'll hook you up with some power. If you're in Maine and the electric grid goes down, Jeremy, he'll take care of you. All right, good. So remember, we had 3.7. The bond matures. All right, so now this bond matures right here. That's the maturity date. And I'm going to invest it in another bond because I'm going to keep – because we're going to keep a 50-50 or whatever it is. We're going to keep the ratio. What I mean, it, it doesn't matter. This is just the way it works. So now we're investing another bond, but we're doing this, and we're going to come back here. And if this doesn't excite you, man, you got no soul. This is freaking fun. I could do this all day long. It's weird. I think about this all the time. It's like – what, am, what and no one's no one we all missed it we all missed it it's crazy this is how bad the financial planning industry is by the way at least with physicists and chemists and you know economists I guess but certainly in the hard science they say that doesn't make sense and financial planning is like man who could but it's, this is nuts it's nuts I'm like let's okay I get your theory but let's put that in the real world it isn't it's impossible to quote Ralph Wiggum. So here in 19, so 10 years goes by. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Ten years go by. And in 1936, uh, the, the end of 1935, the bomb matures. I got to buy a new one in 1936. What am I getting now? I'm getting 2.7. All right. So the same thing is applicable here. The same doggone thing is applicable. So now I'm getting 2.7. Oops, let me just get rid of that real quick. All right, so now I'm getting $2,700 each year for the next 10 years of interest. $2,700. Interest rates went down because there's deflation. So now I'm getting $2,700 each and every year boink, 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 for, for, for 10 years. Hope that makes sense. All right? Now let's go back to the spreadsheet. Oh, man, it's freaking, this is awesome. I can't believe I missed this. I cannot, I, I just, I said there's something not, oh. But I never really took the time to think it out until it hit me, man. All right, so I'm getting 2.7. All right, but now we're starting to get back into inflation. So I'm getting $2,700 a year on that $100,000. 27000 2700 But I need 4000 so now I'm going back up to 3200 32 That's not enough. I'm only getting 27 and I need 32 to keep up with the 4% uh, adjusted for inflation. So what happens here? By the time 19, uh, 36, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. By the time 1946 rolls around, my 2700, 
I'm $1,700 short of what I need. I'm only getting $2,700 in my bond interest. And I need $4,400 by this point. So we fast forward here. Now my bond just matured. Now I'm not getting 2.7, I'm getting 2.2. 2.2% on $100,000. So that's $2,200. But I need freaking $4,400. So now I won't even have half. I get less than half. Now inflation is starting to kick in because stupid war after post World War II. Now it's $5,000 I need. But I only get $2,200. Now it's $55,000, $59,000, But I only get $2,200. Uh, 1956 is 6,216. The bonds right here are now 2.9. So now I'm getting 2.9% on 10 year treasury. I hope this freaking makes sense because it's inherently, it can't, this doesn't work. This doesn't work using intermediate treasury bonds as if you get that rate of return. You're not getting that rate of return. And if we, if we can keep playing this game, we can keep going back to, uh, we can run this for freaking. As many years as we want. Go to let's say 120 or whatever. So we run this. So so we're, we're now I'm getting 2.9, and we get now I'm getting $2,900, but I need 6,200. Now fast forward, and we I, I, I'm telling. You, so now in 1970, 66, I need 7,400, but I'm only getting 4,600. And we can start this any 30 year run. That's the thing about these rolling periods. There's so much similarities. They're not. They're just you. Can't, they're not statistically, statistically reliable at all, because of any thirty-year rolling period, twenty-nine of those are going to be identical to the previous thirty. Twenty-eight of the previous, you know, two. I mean, it's, there's so much overlapping. They're not statistically relevant because there's there's very little. There's so much uh, turn or uh, overlapping, if that makes sense. As such, the, the rolling periods work, but they. It's like okay, but yeah, it's not. That's not statistically relevant. It's just not. So hey, what happens here? Let's say we start in 1960. And this is where it starts getting kind of scary. So we're going to start in 1960. It's okay, Josh. I get you. You're making sense. Once in a while you do. 1960, I'm getting 4.7. All right, 4.7 on a 10-year treasury. All right, so I'm getting back to $4,700 a year, which more than covers the income need I need. I only needed 4000 I'm getting 4,700 bucks, which means essentially I don't have to touch my stocks. Yay. All right. Fast forward. And now that 4,069 is, I need by 1970 is 5,033, but I'm only getting $4,700. So that's not enough. So I needed to go into stocks. Here now I'm getting 7.8. Yay. 7.8. I'm getting $7,800 on a $100,000 investment each and every year, guaranteed. Now I need 5,300 bucks. What am I going to need at the end of this decade? I need $11,000, $11,000, but I'm only getting 7,800 bucks, which means I need to dip in heavy to my stocks. And by the way, you know what my stocks did in 19, uh, basically 1966 to 1982? Basically nothing, basically nothing. All right, but now that the bond matures, I'm getting 10.8. And this is where the bond investor at the beginning of the 80s was living life. So now I'm getting $10,800 on every $100,000 invested, which is fantastic. However, inflation is still eating me alive. So by the time 1990 rolls around, that's I hope you see where I'm going here. And now the interest rates start shrinking. Yeah, this is the same thing so over and over and over again. So that using the 10-year intermediate bond is inherently an error of huge proportions because it cannot be implemented the way it, like the way they say. They say they rebalance every year. How do you rebalance every year? You can't. Now, people say, well, you sell it. And this is what drives me crazy about bonds. Okay. So you rebalance it every year. <laughs> so that means, or like John said, I got to sell my bond to generate more proceeds. Okay, that's great. Let's just say you do that. Do you think the guy on the other side of the trade is an idiot? Do you think he not knows what else is out there in the market? He's not going to. So what always happens? But Josh, the price of my bond is higher than 100000 bucks. I bought it for 100 I can sell it for 110 Okay, you know why? Because you got to reinvest it in something. The interest rates that you're going to reinvest it have dropped proportionally to the price, the, the premium on the share price of your bond. Bonds are uh, the most simplest thing in the world. It's a seesaw. I issue at 100, it matures at 100. 
if I get a 3% coupon. If the coupons and new issue bonds drop to two, all right, I know the price of my bond that I'm getting a 3% coupon is going to go up. Everything's going to reflect the exact same bottom line in terms of current yield. So what that means is if you want my 3% bond, you're going to pay me 110 to get a 3% bond. If you want a 2% bond, you're only going to pay 100. It's that flipping simple. But you can't sit there and say, well, I'm just going to sell my bond and turn around and reinvest it and take the proceeds and turn around and reinvest it in a bond that's that's uh, paying less because it's all going to be the same. The people on the bond side aren't stupid. They know exactly what the current yield is. They know exactly why you're selling your bond because you're willing to take a premium price for it. And either A, you're going to freaking bank that money, you know, pay off some debt, you know, light cigars, $100 bills, or you're going to reinvest it in another bond. Well, in that case, you just traded because this guy who bought the bond from you was going to do the same thing. But now you're that guy. So now you got to find another bond to, to buy so you can get in income off it. Well, good luck finding the same yield. You're not going to. You're going mean, to find the same yield, but you can pay a premium. Ah, you're not going to pay. The get, you'll get, you get a different coupon, I guarantee, but you're going to pay a premium or you'll pay a discount. But when they, all of a sudden it does, it's be the exact same yield. All right. So that can't work. And inherently that can't work. I hope that makes sense. So that 4% rule is based on flawed data. There's just no other way around that. However, what they should have done, let's go to this now. I want to show you what they should have done uh, because I, I can't believe no one picked this up. It's nuts. What they should have done is they should have used um, one month T-bills. This is basic cash. We're going to say this is savings account essentially. One month treasury bills. One month treasury bills turn over every 30 days. So they're liquid. All right, so one month treasury bills turn over every 30 days. So you can see now, let's go back to 1926. Actually, you know I'm going to, am I sharing this with you? Yeah, all right, sweet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the difference between one month treasury bills and the 10 year, because there is some pretty significant differences. So let me get out of this real quick and go back to my other, oh, wait, uh, where do I get over this? Oh yeah, right there. All right, hold on. Because the, the you can do all this with with thirty day treasury bills. Remember, a treasury bill is usually a government bond that matures within a year. Um, some will say one hundred eighty days. That's fine, uh, I, but they call it, they can call a treasury note as something which matures within seven years or so. I don't think there's any you know true you know data on that. It says oh, it's an eight year maturity. It's a treasury bond, not a treasury note. Just remember, if you're hearing treasury bills that matures within a, a year, essentially, that's what I would say. If you're hearing treasury notes, I would say that's anything that matures within five years. And, and again, people can argue that's fine. A uh, treasury bond is more of a long term. So what we're using here is just treasury bonds, intermediate 10 years, and treasury bills, which are less than, in this case, 30 days. So they're, 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 they're cycling every 30 days, every 30 days, every 30 days, which is cool. All right. So now we're going to go and I'm going to show you what I did um, because you rely on me to do all your homework for you, my friends. And here is the cheat sheet on your homework. So we're going to show you this screen I came up with. All right. So I want to share with you this. Um, the, old, the longest term government bond. Let me just share this with you a second. The longest term government bond of any significance was the Fidelity Government Bond Fund, an intermediate government bond fund. I just went to, uh, oh, let me just, I went to Schwab. Uh, let's see if I'm, yeah, all right, sweet. Uh, make sure there's no personal data here. No, all right. So I went to my Schwab account. I said, oh, let me show it, share it with you. And I said, let's find the government bond funds that have any, um, and a long-term inception. And the longest one was federated. I don't want to use that. Franklin's probably not a bad one, but it's all Ginny May, and I don't want to use Ginny May. Uh, so Fidelity is essentially the 10-year, is intermediate government bonds, basically 10 years. So this is the first time we actually see liquidity in the government bond market. Now, this changes things because unlike a treasury bond where you're buying the bond outright, and it's not liquid unless you, which just, you can't, I mean, look, man. So immediately, the whole data set from 1926 to basically 1980, in this case, 1979, is shot because you can't do what the freaking spreadsheets say. It's, it's, you just, it's impossible to do what the spreadsheets that these guys are using saying. So the first time we actually have liquidity here is with Fidelity, right? Because Fidelity is a mutual fund manager and they're doing all the, the stuff that you were doing previously. They're doing it for you, essentially. All right, so what I said is, okay, let's use the Fidelity. Voya used to be ING, which I think used to be Reliastar. 
I, I just – I don't trust these guys as far as I could kick them. So we're going to use a Fidelity. All right, so – and Fidelity is a good company. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident with Fidelity. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look up the Fidel, Fidelity – well, I did all this again. I'm doing your homework. Um, we're going to look up Fidelity. Like, like, like button. Every, I'm just, I forget to say that. And some of y'all do a much obliged, but uh, I probably should say it on occasion too. I should probably sell you on stuff. You know, uh, go buy my blue box glasses or buy my, uh, well, I don't know what the hell. I got to start selling you stuff. Go uh, buy my chair. Oh, that's what I got. Some people email me about want me to sell their chair on my YouTube channel. I was like, I'm not going to do that. My wife's like, you should. Nope, not doing any of that crap. Um, uh, if I get a product that I love, which I do on occasion, I'll certainly hawk it to you, you know, through an Amazon link. But uh, I, I'm not inclined to. You should buy this. You know, I, I think you should buy my calculator. The text, the old good old fashioned twelve was a twelve B one. Or BA2, that's what it is. BA2, Texas Instruments, 20 bucks. Anyway, so uh, if you find that I'm hawking stuff, you should buy my uh, my Manscape. <laughs> I don't know why this stuff just bothers me when people hawk a lot of products like that, especially because there's already ads on YouTube. Uh, anyway, all right, let's go back. So we're going to use uh, a Fidelity uh, government bond fund, and this is the first year we actually have liquidity. So here are the returns of Fidelity government bond versus the 10-year treasury. We're going to come back to the 30-day bill here in just a second. My nose itches. And what you're going to see is in 1980, the 10-year treasury, we talked about it, was 10.8. The Fidelity government bond is only 6.7. 10.6, 26.6, a lot. Look at the differentials. Negative 4, negative 2, 11% more, negative 4. Huge differentials on any given year. So this is a non-liquid you can't just buy and sell this to create more liquidity. It doesn't work like that. Now, you can buy and sell this to create liquidity. That's a fact. That's a fact. And now that we have more and more government bonds out there, you're, you're going to be fine. But, I mean, the difference between something that's actually liquid and something that is not is significant in the, ex the excess rates of return or the differential rates of return. So the excess of the government bond fund versus the non-liquid treasury, negative, negative, huge positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, big time. If we go all the way down to 2020, uh, the difference is 1.11% on average. On uh, well, If you just average them up, Fidelity averaged 7.01, where the 10-year treasury averaged 5.91. So let's just go back here, 2020. Fidelity is up 6.79. The 10 year treasury average 0.89. 2019, 6.41. 10 year treasury average 1.9. Notice the 10 year treasury, there's no negative years here at all. None. No negative years in the 10 year treasury. It's impossible for the 10 year treasury to give you a negative year. That's just, it's impossible. So know that. No negative year. Now, when I say it's impossible, they could always give you a, a negative interest rate. And that's a policy that many, many countries are doing. But as we sit here today, that would have to be this, the, uh, deliberate action on the federal government. Uh, and so they're not doing that. And I don't think they ever will. Who knows? But anyway, you can see we do have some negative year. 2013 negative year. Uh, 2008 is interesting because that's when you know it's a government bond. In 2008, if it's a government bond, it made money. Everything else got crushed. So in 2008, we're up 11. We did have a negative year in 2013. Uh, we only had one half 1% in 2015, where the 10 year treasury is up 400% more than we were. Uh, we had a negative year in 1999, near two and a quarter. 10 year treasury had a, a better by 7%. A negative year in 1994, when the Fed was raising, 10 year treasury was up by 5.8. So a significant differential there. And I think we had no more because we started in 1980. But we can see. So to say, <laughs> To use this as a liquid account when it's actually this is the liquid account, when this is giving us returns that are just not even anywhere near the, the ballpark of the, the actual returns that these guys are using, the 4% rule is just, uh, oh, hold on a second, my beautiful. Hello. Yeah, I'm on a live stream right now. You want to say everybody hi to everybody? Oh, no. Huh? Are you really? Yeah, I'm on a live stream. Hey, girl. Hello. You want to say hi to everybody, Coco? Uh, there you are. Hi. Hey, it's Chloe. They're in Philadelphia. <laughs> Babes, let's see you real quick. People don't think I'm married. They they think uh, I think I, Chloe's a rented daughter. Hey, there's my wife. Hey. All right, we'll call you later. Love you.
Oh, wait, is that Maddie? Does she want to be on there too? Nope. Oh, she just hung up on me. Oh, my goodness. She's Louise and Blue Cheese. That's my wife. I told you I had a wife. She's not a rental wife either. She's really married. But it's not. I actually said, hey, some Facebook lady. I'm not on Facebook. Can you pretend to be my wife? Um, all right. So, well, oh, I want now. Okay. So, the real way you do this is you look at the 30 day treasury bill. All right. The 30 day bill. So, I want to go back now and let's just see what this is. So, here's a 30 day bill and here's a 10 year treasury. And you can see the 30 year, the 30 day uh, was uh, excess of 10 year over 30 day. So, <laughs> I don't know how else to say this, but the, I mean, if you're using the 10 year treasury, you're giving a significant shot in the arm relative to the 4% rule from reality, which is the only liquidity we had was a 30 year treasuries, a 30 day bills. That's it. What's up, doll? I hope they're not pooping everywhere. So, the, I mean, so watch this the 30 day average. 1.75. Oh, wait, 4.28, excuse me, 4.28 for the, for the last, what's that, 40 years. The 10 year treasury averaged 5.91, which is a difference of uh, uh, whatever that is, 1.75. Does that was telling me? No, difference of, let's see, hold on a sec, equals that minus that. 1.62, an annual rate of 1.62. So banging and all at all, we're using this, which isn't good enough. It's not. They should have been using this. And if you were to use that, you have to reduce your your return by 1.62%. If you take 1.62 divide by 5.91, that 1.62 uh, divide by 5.91, that's 27%. You have to reduce. The the of the four of the four percent rule, you got to reduce the bond side by twenty seven percent. Yeah. Now you could do a liquid account, which gives you the boost that we're looking for. You know, but it's gonna be more volatile. And the thing with the liquid account, because it's more volatile, is that stops the whole thing with the four percent rule, because a ten year treasury is always positive every year. Ah. <sighs> I feel like what's the name for Back to the Future? You know, the Doc, Doc Brown with Einstein. I'm like, this is crazy. How did no one see this? You can't do that. You cannot use this and define a 4%, 5%. I don't give a crap what the rule is because it's not a liquid portfolio. You can only use the 30-day treasury. So let's go back. Oh, man, it drives me insane. How can only 158 people see this? This is brilliant. This is, this is brilliant, man. You guys are hearing brilliance from me. Yes, this is brilliance from me. Not glad. This is fantastic. Everyone else should have figured this out. I, hell, I've been in this business since 1998. I studied it since 1994. How the hell did I not know this? Because I'm a freaking idiot. But, you know, I'm a curious idiot. I say, huh, what am I missing here? There's got to be something I'm missing. What am I missing? No one else is missing it because a lot of people just aren't curious enough, which is frustrating. Now, so let's keep going. I want to show you. Oh, man, it's so freaking frustrating. No wonder why everyone's falling for Dr. Fauci. Ah, I just can't stand that guy. Um, let's go here. All right, so we're going to go to uh, – uh, we're going to compare. I want. Uh, we're just going to take this out. We're going to compare. The, yeah, here we go. All right, sweet. Let's go all the way back. We're going to go back to the future. Isn't he a dreamboat? Isn't he a dreamboat? You know who said that? All right, so we got uh, – here's inflation. Here's the ten, the one month, the thirty day bill, and here's ten year treasury. So we're just gonna go back. Oh my lands, thirty day bill is paying thirty basis points, twenty basis points, twenty basis points, twenty basis points, thirty basis points, zero zero. The ten year is paying three point three, three point one, two point eight, two point seven. Look at this from 1933 to freaking 1948. The 30-day bill was paying less than 1%. From 1933 to 1948, the 10-year is paying, looks like on average, about three. I, uh, <sighs> All right, so then we go to freaking 1949. We don't break. So basically, it was paying less than 2% from 1933 
1955, where the th- the ten year is paying, we'll say, average on two and three quarters from 1933 to 1955. It's crazy. Now let's go back. We're going to go back to the time when inflation started kicking in. So here's a here they go. A little bit even, Stephen. There, the 30 days paying more, but it's a short term paying more. Oops, oops, I just screwed that up. Hold on a second. Ah, what do I do? I don't want to go back here. Oops, what happened? Oh, hold on a second. All right. So here we go. 8% in 1974, the 10 year treasury is paying 7. You lock in the 10 year treasury at 7%. The very, the very next year, it was actually really the next month, but the very next year, it changed to 5.8. You're still getting 7% of the 10-year treasury, 5.1. Still get 7% of the 10-year treasury. Then it goes up to 10.4. You're still getting 7% of the 10-year treasury. That's 14.7, again, just for a short time. And this is going to be, by this time, you're getting, you're almost ready to mature that 10-year treasury to here and get 11.7 for the next 10 years. Completely different dynamics, completely different. So by the time this 10-year, like you're getting 10, 11.7 from 1984 until 1994, and the, and the 30 day bill is going from 9.8 to 7.6 to, to 5 to 6 to 8 to 7 to 5 to 3 to 2 to 3. Oh, it just it's, it's freaking nuts, man. So, I hope that makes sense. There's some, there's some serious knowledge there, and the, the point being is now that we have liquidity. Um, in the market, does that do better or worse for the 4% rule? The 4% rule is completely just blown up now. There's no other way around that because we don't know. We don't know. We got we got a track record of government bonds uh, going back to just 1980, essentially. Uh, for And we have other bonds. I did a video the other day on the, uh, the Putnam bond fund, which looks pretty good. But that, that's not a government bond. It's not. It's freaking all kinds of stuff, which I like. You know what I'm saying? I used it in one of my videos. I said, that's pretty good, how bonds saved retirement. And it did. But that's not government That's not government bonds. That's everything. And the 4%, the premise of the 4% was government bonds. The Trinity study was corporate bonds, high-yielding corporate, high-quality corporate bonds. And that gave us about 4.4. But they were doing the same thing. They weren't doing, you know, there was no liquidity. Ah, and so if we use li- liquid markets, that inherently is more volatile, and you're probably going to get a little bit, at least the last 40 years from the fidelity, you got a better rate of return. There's just no two ways around that. No two ways around that. The, the drawback, though, is that at the end of the day, the more volatility creates more downside risk on your 4% rule mechanism. I also want to show you something else, my man Dan Kuhlberg's uh, um, thing here, because this is fantastic. This is another thing I like a lot. Um, 55e.co, by the way, 55e.co. All right, so we got, oops, oh man, keep doing that. All right, so what we're going to do is we got, we're going to go back to 1926 and we're just going to do for 20 years. And I'm going to show you what happens every 20 years. If we just take 50,000 in the, uh, the, the, the 30 day treasuries and 50,000 in the 10 year. All right, so for, we're not taking money out, just for simplicity. All right, I guess we could, well, We'll, 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 let's mess with this first. All right, so for 20 years, 1926 to 1945, we start with 50,000 bucks. By the time we're done, we have 61,000 with the 10-year treasuries, with a, with a uh, 30-day treasury, 30-day bill. By the time we're done with the 10-year treasuries, you've got 88,000. You see that? You see that right there is another 27,000 we could have used towards retirement. Nuts. All right, so now let's do this. Let's go to 19, 20, 45. We're going to go to 19... 46. All right. And it's going to be the same thing. All right. So the 30 day treasuries, uh, 50,000 started 1946, was worth 73,000 in 1965. 10 year treasury was worth 92,000. Now the 20,000 bucks. You seen a similarity there? And it's the same thing at every 20 year time frame. I'm not going to do it with you guys right here today. You just have to trust it, but it's nuts. It just goes to show you this 4% rule was way over aggressive when the actual real world numbers are being used. The one year treasury bill, 10 year, tre- the, the 30 year uh, and a 30 day uh, was worth 204,000 at the end of 20 years. The 10 year tre- treasury is 242. Again, another, you know, it's just significantly more. And then we'll finally go to the last one here, which, uh, 
would be 1986. And the ten-year Treasury, or the thirty-year, thirty-month, thirty-month is worth one twenty-two. Ten-year Treasury one seventy-four. Now, lastly, let's just go two thousand to two thousand twenty. Actually, does he go back to two thousand twenty? I don't think he does. I think he goes back to two thousand nineteen. Here, he needs to update that, and, and he will. Um, and here, are the ten-year, uh, the thirty, thirty days, sixty-nine thousand. Ten-year Treasury, basically hundred thousand bucks. All right, so let's try something else. You ready? We're going to do one other thing here. Let's just zero this out for just a second. And we're going to do 100000 bucks in here. And we're going to take 4000 a year off this each and every year, adjusted for inflation. And we're going to start in 1926. Oops. What's up, bud? That's what I'm talking about. And we're going to go for 30 years. And see how long that lasts. And we ran out of money in year 30. So on the on the 30 day portfolio, we were able to take out four uh, percent a year, adjusted for inflation. So you see deflation the first couple of years, basically the first decade. And then it ran out of money. Our last year was in 1955. So that was that. I would say that's a success for sure. Now I'll switch these numbers over. And look at what the 10 year treasury did. The 10 year treasury. Again, you can't do, you literally can't do the 10 year treasury, but I'm going to show you anyway. And the 10 year treasury survived. We had $45,000 less left when the, the 30 day ran out of money. All right. But because you don't want to have any overlapping to make it statistically relevant, we're going to go to 1946. All right. And we'll start with the 10 year treasury because we're already there. And that ran out of money in 1968. So that ran out of money after uh, in year 30, uh, year 22. All right, so right there, that ran out of money in year 22, which it says right here, it says year 24. Why? Why does it say year 24? Well, I've made that as 24 years. Okay. Anyway, it ran out of money right there. All right, so now let's go to the 10 year, not the 10 year, let's go to the one month treasury. And that ran a money year 20. There you go. Look at that. So I hope this shows you that the 10 year is way too optimistic for the 4% rule because you couldn't do it. Uh, and let's go to 1946, 66. We're going to 1966 now. I want to start. It's going to get ugly, my friends. My amigos, it's going to get ugly. Speedy Gonzalez, fastest mouse in Mexico. A weight check. Who is the slowest mouse in Mexico? Who's the slowest mouse in Mexico? Dude, we got to make sure you guys are awake here. We'll probably get banned from YouTube for saying this. All right, so the, what are we on here? We're on the 30-day uh, uh, the treasury bill, and that ran out of money in year 28. All right, so the 30-day treasury bill, if we started in 1966, with high inflation ran out of money in year 28. Let's see what the 10-year did. And... And the 10 year ran out of money. Never. All right. So there you go, man. Look at that. The 10 year still had freaking uh, 54,000 bucks in 1995. All right. Let's just do, uh, we'll just do, for simplicity, let's do 1990 to 2019. Um, all right. So, question Can you all make friends with salad? Can you make friends with salad? Oh, right here. Oh, right here. There it says right there. Cool. Bucket one, starting amount, wait, final amount, bucket two, there you go. All right, there. So bucket two, we never ran out of money. All right, that would be the 10-year treasury. But here's bucket, oh, cool. There you go. Look, man, freaking Dan. Dan is the man. Right. Bucket one, we never ran out of money. But we still had 223000 What if I put it like this? What happens? Compare the two. Oh, yes. It, oh, look at that. That's fantastic. Bucket two at 151,000 more. Crazy. Under, yeah, 51 is crazy. That's freaking nuts, man. Anyway, well, that makes sense. So uh, the, the issue is when you go back to um, the volatile stuff, that's going to make it that much harder. Uh, what, what it says is that you can have a higher percentage, but there's going to be a higher probability, a higher percentage withdrawal, but a higher probability 
of running out of money for sure. Um, and so for you, I, I just hope that makes sense. So I just, any of this literature you hear, you just got to say, what the hell, man? Do any of these guys, and look, again, I get it. I get what Banging was doing. I do. But it's like these freaking uh, photovoltaic things in, in these labs. We get 37% efficiency. You can't put that on a rooftop, man. You're never going to be able to put it on the rooftop. Yeah, you might have a some freaking vacuum sealed lab. But okay, that doesn't mean crap for me trying to get freaking suns and turn to electricity. And it never will. It never will. Nuts. Anyway, what else I want to say on that? I guess that's all I got to say on that. Let me see if any, if any of you guys have thoughts or questions on that. Because uh, And I do have some comments about, well, if that doesn't work, what does? All right. Oh, I want to talk a little bit about Tesla here in just a second. All right. Slow poke packs a gun. Yes, sir. Slow poke Rodriguez. I love slow poke. He is the best. Oh, we got a. My grandma was born 1965. I was born in 1970. Yeah, so she was uh, 55 years old. She had old Jane here when she was 25, right? That's no, I don't think that's no. Then she couldn't be on here. Yeah, that would make sense. I have not run a Monte Carlo with a 50% SPY and 50% FGOVX uh, rebalance annually. I have not. Um, and it's a good question. So Kim says, what should the uh, the rule be? Well, we're going to talk about that. Uh, HR Block mentioned me to take 6% to pay off house almost as much as it was before I start paying it off. HB, HR Block said to mention take 6% to pay off the house. I'm not sure I don't get that. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, it's F, yeah, FGO, FGOVX, yeah. And, and look, I'm not even saying this one I like. I'm just saying that's the one that goes back to – look, the Vanguard Ginny May went back, but I wasn't try, – I was trying to stay away from Ginny May. Ginny May is his own unique scenario. I love Ginny May. That's my favorite bond fund. But I wasn't trying to do that. I wasn't trying to do that. Hey, right on, man. You call my wife Miss? Yeah, Josh buried up right on, man. Um, Scanlon right on. My wife is Miss. Um, get one of my Pablo videos to go viral. Yeah. Get, oh, Pablo picture on a t-shirt. That's a good idea. Market your dog, Josh. I don't know where he's at right now, man. Uh, don't knock the manscaping. Yeah, 100%. There are no products that go with financial planning. Exactly. I'd wear a ball cap. Sell a Pablo autograph. Now, I don't, I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. I, look, I just think financial planning is a lot like economics. Uh, economists, John. Economists are desperate, desperate to be seen as a hard science, and they never will be because there's too much freaking human action involved. Thus, Ludwig von Mises, Human Action uh, book, which is classic. Uh, is you can't, you know, what economists think is rational, doing all these income annuities, a lot of people don't. As they, are the economists wrong? Are the people wrong who are not giving over their money? Well, the problem about thinking the economists aren't wrong is we've seen them wrong a thousand times a Sunday, kind of like climatologist. Hell, wake me when you're right. Wake me when you get it right. All I see is freaking 50 years. Well, hell, you know, I mean, for doom and gloom as far as I can see, and yet we're still sitting here pretty. We're certainly not running out of food to eat. We're too obese nowadays, and the economists are all saying, we're all going to die of starvation. Oh, the climate, I mean, the climatology is crazy. Um, no, that's not the moral of the story. No, not at all. I don't think that's the case at all. I actually, no, 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 no. The moral of the story is that I think a lot of people underuse their portfolio for retirement. Because don't forget, these rules were premised on that your spending is going to go up each and every year with inflation. 
And there's no evidence of that either. The evidence is the exact opposite. The evidence. So I don't think it banging in Proverbs millions of people at all. In fact, I don't know how it wasn't him that said, hey, everybody, I got the 4% rule. He never he never said that. I like Bill Bangin. He writes good stuff. I'm a fan. I'm, he's saying now he uses 5%. I like it. So Kim says, what's the rule? I say 5%. I say because the 4% is, is based on stuff that you literally cannot replicate. It, is this the whole thing with these freaking data on – just uh, the whole – they can't replicate the data. Sorry if I banged the table. People say, you banged the table too much. I can't help it. Can't replicate the data. It's not scientific method. You got to be able to replicate the data, and we're not replicating the data here. Inherently, it cannot be like it's. No one's saying it's proven. They're just using it as a benchmark. I get that, but it's taking this aura of freaking. I mean, the fire movement is all based on that. It's not. It has taken this aura because of lazy financial planners. It has nothing to do with banging. Banging is the first. Well, not the first, but one of the first guys to bring this to people's attention. About the insanity of saying, oh, you got 8% a year. You got 10% a year. You can take 8% a year, blah, blah, blah. People used to say it all the time. Freaking idiots. Benga said, no, you can't. So at least it brought the debate down to earth, but it wasn't enough. And, and unfortunately, it became sacrosanct because so many damn people in my business are lazy. They just want to be told what to do. A lot of people don't like this stuff. A lot of people just want to sell stuff, make assets under management, freaking churn the accounts or reverse churn. Reverse churns means they sit on the AUM and they don't earn the fee anymore. They don't earn it. They say, hey, here's our portfolio. So diverse our portfolio is great. We're you know only on ETFs and we're charging 1%. Yeah, you're keeping up with the Jones. It's all good. And that's the, I mean, just nuts, man. It's reverse churning. And I hate it. I hate it more than I hate freaking commission-based salesmen. Because it's not they all because they all act holier than now. We're fiduciaries. At least I know with my man Dustin Tibbetts down at Jazz Wealth that he's freaking earning his money. But Mar Shaw, I know for a fact he's earning his money. Uh, my man Jack, uh, John a blank, Zarinsky, Zarinsky up in uh, Arlington, uh, Arlington, up in Fairfax, Virginia. I know he's earning his money. A lot of these guys don't. Man. They just don't. I'm sorry. It's reverse churning where they just sit on the assets just to, to collect the fee each and every year. It freaking infuriates me. But we're not commissioned. You're, hell, you're worse. You're worse. You're worse than a commission because you're getting that 1% fee each and every year on a growing asset base. The commission guy just sold something, and that's it. Unless he has to come back and sell you something else again. Well, I mean, it, that's up to you not to buy it. But that <laughs> you're telling me because you're a fiduciary and you're sitting on this asset, growing asset base at 1% a year, you're more legitimate than a guy who sold – a freaking, you know, 250,000 of American funds, a shares. That's freaking insane. I'll, I'll take the American funds, a shares any day a week, any day of the week. Anyway. So, but I don't want to think that Bill Bangin is anything negative here. It's not in the least, not because no one thought about this. And, but yet it, from practicality, and this is where I think having an interest in other like people say, but you're not a scientist. How dare you talk about climate, climate stuff? I hope I'm not. Am I freezing up here? Um, can't do. Um, but but what, I'm, what I'm going with this is that um, it, it's like the climate, like the climate uh, people say, oh, you're not a PhD in physics or you're not this. I don't give a crap. I'm interested. I read. It's fun. It's fun to learn things. It's also fun to say, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. If it can't make sense to a lay person, then apparently there's something wrong with it. Um, you have to be able to explain things. Keep it simple, stupid. And if you can't, then yeah, you probably don't grasp your subject the way you think you do, frankly. Anyway, so, all right, cool, right on, sick puppy. So the rule of thumb should be five. And the reason it should be five is because 4% has always been suspect, in my opinion. And it wasn't until this just hit me, but suspect just because I had people spending each and every year on inflation. And there's, the evidence is 100% against that, 100%. Now, people all say, what about health care? Uh, look, I talk about that in my book. Uh, nope, not that one. I got another book down there. I talked about uh, you can retire on Social Security. I talked about uh, the the true cost of healthcare for the vast majority of us, and it ain't what the media says. It's just not I'm financial media. That is, um, yeah. Some people do. Some people pay a lot of money for long term care. The vast majority don't. It's just a, it's just that simple. So if you factor in that that is an outlier, and uh, you know what else are outliers? Well, outliers are falling off a freaking ladder. Outliers are getting hit by you know breaking your vertebrae in a car crash. You can't plan for that stuff because it's impossible to plan for because they're so far outliers. Um, you, you just can't. So anyway, the point being here is 5% says, okay, we don't really know 
uh, we have a pretty good idea that inflation uh, that we're going our spending is going to decline as we age. That is true. Um, we know that five percent historically uh, has done pretty well. There's been some times it ran out of money. I grant you. Uh, we also know that we're not stupid. We know to tighten our belt if the situation you know makes us need to tighten our belt. Uh, again, I cannot stress why people don't say this. I sorry, Mrs. Mrs. Client. I know you want to take a trip to freaking you know the Great Wall of China. Uh, but you can't, man. I mean, you can do whatever the hell you want. But if you do, it's going to put your portfolio at risk. It just is. We never, we don't talk about reverse mortgages. Uh, we don't talk about downsizing. Um, and, and that's the whole thing with five percent. Say, look, man, you got a hundred thousand bucks. Take five five thousand a year. If you want to adjust it for inflation, that's fine. Just, re but just remember uh, that I'm not using a five percent adjustment with inflation. So you'd have to do that. But what I suggest is, you say, what do I need? All right, I got a hundred thousand bucks. I need seven thousand this year. Well, take seven thousand. Fast forward the following year. Why do we need? Do we need another seven thousand? If so, why? Uh, well, I I really enjoyed you know going to the casinos. Well, maybe don't do that this year. I mean, you see what I'm saying? That that's it's, it's got to be a fluid thing. It, could, it should not just be this. The first year I take four percent year, I'm never changing stat tactics. And I get tactics. And Bill Bang Bang never said that. Either. He did. I did. A lot of financial planners say, well, that would violate the 4% rule, Joe. And another thing, the 4% rule is premise on that you're going to live for 30 years. The vast majority of us do not live for the 30 years. Now, the life expectancy has fallen to 78 or was 70. No, I think it was like 77, down like a full full and a half, a year and a half from two years ago. And now before, last year it fell before COVID. In 2019, it fell. It fell like one half of, of one year before COVID. COVID came, it fell another year. Remember, the life expectancy is when you're born, when you're a newborn baby, bounce a baby today. Uh, and so that life expectancy for everybody's fallen by, by a year and a half over the last two years. The life expectancy, I guarantee, for you know 60 and 65-year-old people has fallen dramatically, if you just look at those people, uh, simply because of COVID, I guarantee. And it, look, man, um, we know part of the reason why COVID was so devastating, because so many people are ill. They're ill inside. We know that, man. We know. We just know. Immune systems are shot, obese, type two diabetes. All I mean, all this crap, man. All this crap. Their immune systems are shot. Stress. Watch too much politics on TV. I tell you, man. I um, it's weird. Um, I, I just it's one of those things. Like, it's, what was I got? I was reading something today. I forgot what it was. I said. That just doesn't it doesn't bother me anymore. It's weird, man. Like after the uh, maybe it's watching my man Anomaly, you know, listen to Owen Benjamin. And I love um, I love Owen Benjamin. I, I think he's fantastic. Where I just it's like how do you, it's like you recognize it's out of your control. It's out of your control. Why are you gonna let it bother you? You see what I'm saying? Like it just there's nothing you can do about it. You, you want to get down to your local precinct, I get that. But other than that, it's like nothing you can't control freaking Kamala Harris. Like there's somebody that said, I can't believe that guy's not behind bars and it wasn't Cuomo. I can't remember what it was, but I was like, this is not, but I said, it just didn't bother me. It's weird. I said, I think I'm getting mature. I think I'm, I'm, I'm maturing as I age. Like it's just what used to really drive me crazy politically. I just, I just don't care. I mean, like, so look, there's nothing I do about it. And I don't know, you know, if it's just, I started listening to people. I don't know what it is, but I just know I like, I like the people who straight shoot and say, look, man, what are you going to do anyway? All right. So you get pissed off. What's that going to do? It doesn't do anything. I, I, Dave Cullen, I love Dave Cullen, you know, um, out in Ireland, big fan of his as well. He just points and said, look, it's evil out there, but, but you don't have to be evil. Just ignore it, ignore it, and live the life the best you can. And I, and I, I trust him. I say, well, all it takes is uh, for no one to stand up for tyranny to, to happen. Well, we're under it, man. We're already, I mean, it's here. It's not, it's not jack booted thugs, but literally it's here. It's here. It's nuts what's happening. It's insane. I, and, you know, in Canada, they still, I, the whole thing is insane. And I'm just sick of it. So I don't know. Maybe it's just interesting. I, I, I literally don't know what it is, but I'm just, it's like, not, well, maybe because I start picking up the good book again, actually. That's, ooh, that's probably it. You start picking up the good book, you're like, eh, whatever, man. You know, it's like a, like, uh, sands in the hourglass. This is the days of our lives. Well, that? It's like sands in the hourglass. Remember, you used to skip school in high school or middle school or something like that, and you watch the there was no other TV, nothing else on except soap operas, and you watch Guiding Light, Days of Our Lives. There's another one at 10 a.m. Guiding Light was 11, and Days of Our Lives, I think, it was 12. 
I remember Guiding Light had Nikki, a, a smoking hot blonde chick, and Victor, who looked like P, uh, Tom Thomas Selleck. I remember Nikki and Victor on one of those shows. Days of Our Lives, Guiding Light. I never liked that General Hospital one. That didn't do anything for me. Hmm. Huh. Anyway, uh, Neil, for, uh, did he do anything? I mean, I, for uh, getting Brexit, is that what we're talking about? Because, I mean, I'm a big fan. Yep, soaps right on. You know what I'm talking about, Lynn? The the uh, the Victor and Nikki? Remember those guys? Um, I used to watch General Hospital. Jeremy, you're freaking too young for that crap, man. Uh, so has Neil Farage done something different? Because I appreciate the, the Brexit. Uh, it turns out freaking Boris is a clown. Boris the clown. Boom, 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 boom. Boris the clown. Boom, 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 boom. All right, Jane, a single debt free your peers have 100,000 student K loans, 200K houses to pay for. You say houses in the plural, living check to check and juggling three kids. That's crazy. Oh, by peers. Okay. Whew. I thought you said I got your parents there. I was like, woof. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, the biggest freaking scam ever in the history of mankind is the education system. The biggest scam. The transfer of wealth from poor, ignorant youngins to older, well-to-do, upper-middle-class wokesters in the education establishment is evil. And we find – and look, man, I got a kid at Georgia Tech. I, Chloe, they're looking at schools right now. The thank God, the good Lord, Chloe has freaking. She's got her foots on the ground. She's like, I just whatever I want to do, Dad, Josh, Dad. I just don't want to get out of college with any debt. I said, Hallelujah. I said, You know, you can go to community college and live here if you want. She was really, you let me. I said, Freaking, you can. You're, you. My kids are welcome anytime, anytime. I pray the good Lord they don't get involved in meth or heroin. I, I, oh, I don't know what I'd do if they became zombies. Trust me. I know many people who've seen their children become zombies or friends or daughters, and it's horrible. Or, um, or uh, well, I guess not parents. But anyway, I, said, oh, I just pray that they don't. But I, I told Chloe, I said, man, you can go to Kennesaw State. You can drive. we got freaking community colleges all over Georgia. Drive down there. You can live right here, man. No big deal. Get a part-time job. Just get out of school, no debt. Or go in the military. I don't think she wants to do that. Or go to a, you know, go learn Spanish. You know, go freaking uh, go down to Latin America. You know, and live with somebody. And I, I just, there's oh, the idea of so many kids they just default to go to these schools and spend a hundred thousand dollars to learn nothing, nothing. They're not learning critical thinking. I mean, I, I would, I would understand if you went to a college to learn critical thinking. That's not happening, and that, that, that's by far not happening. Now. Man, it's crazy. And it's coming to the science departments, people. It's coming. You know what happened to the Soviet Union? The same thing. You know what happened to China? You think it's not happening in Venezuela, Turkey? It's happening. It's, gonna, it's happening here. Sad, man. I was just, you know, it's like a side so camera. Someone's saying, it's like, look, man, these guys, they're, they're so, they just, they just have to have their jobs. And I get it. And this is where I, I get it, man. You get so accustomed to spending and spending and spending that you just you it scares the hell out of you not to be able to spend. I look, I I've been there. When we first moved to Texas, we had this nice house. I mean, because we had we just got what's the uh, sticker shock, the reverse sticker shock. We're like, holy crap, we can buy this house for basically just a little bit more of a mortgage than what we was paying in friggin' Virginia for a you know a three bed, one bath ranch. Whoa. Uh, anyway, long story short, we probably bought too big um, because I the first year at USA was a struggle. And I said, "Man, I'm gonna get laid off," and all my all the neighbors could look at me and say, "Oh, poor Josh, he's got no job. They're gonna have to go bankrupt and foreclose and blah blah blah." I was like, "Man, it's gonna be embarrassing," you know what I'm saying? And I said, "I, you know, I'll go get another job, but I, you know, it's just still gonna be embarrassing." And uh, anyway, that n didn't happen, but that was a mistake. It was a mistake. Now, we'd have college debt by then, but uh, still, man. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's too bad, Jane. I, uh, I, wish, I wish that didn't happen. That sucks, man. Um, Jeremy says he wants, yeah, $30,000, $40,000, $2,500 a month, man, annually. I, I, that's 
that's a, that's easily attainable, man. Too many. Uh, Lee says, should the five percent be calculated in the cash cash portion of the portfolio too? The cash portion of the assets too. So, like, you got twenty thousand in cash, forty thousand in stocks, and forty thousand bonds. Is that what you're saying? Um. Yeah, I think you're right, Harry. I think you're right. He thinks that 1.9 trillion would end up in the stock market. I think a good amount of it will. Absolutely, I think it's right home. My oil stocks uh, love a hundred dollar barrel. <laughs> uh, plan for a sweet, sweet retirement with that sweet, sweet YouTube cash. I got that from Tim Pool, by the way. He said that that sweet, sweet cash, or he said those sweet, sweet clicks. I think I can't remember. Uh, is LTC insurance a waste? I have LTC insurance. I do. So just I, I I don't I don't I don't feel like getting a big thing on long term care insurance right now. But I do have long term care insurance. Um, generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of it. That's all there is to it. I, well, let me just explain. I, so the reason is I got four kids. Uh, Kim, uh, my wife works uh, you know basically part time, and she doesn't make that. She basically works for healthcare. Is what's going on. So with four kids and all the income basically comes from this guy because of you guys being here and paying me that sweet, sweet YouTube money by watching the ads and clicking them on. And a lot of you hire me. I'm much obliged. Um, and I sell some books and uh, things of that nature. Um, see, my has something else I'm going to say. Oh, anyway, so if, you know, there is a, a sizable group of people um, that are in nursing homes that have strokes and stuff like that. They're under the age of 65. It's not a huge amount. Uh, but enough that makes me concerned that if something were to go wrong with this lump of coal, Charlotte would be skunked. There's no other way around that. So she'd have to marry Vinyl here because Vinyl's got more money than God. Just ask him. He'll tell you. So Charlotte would be like, Vinyl, um, um, I know you watch Josh's YouTube channel on occasion, but you know um, he doesn't even remember who he is. Will you take me in? And Vinyl said, yeah, come here, sweet thing. Come here. And uh, – and so anyway, instead of that happening, I got a long-term care policy just in case. Now, I'm going to drop it the minute the kids are out and the, this house is paid off. Uh, because at, at the end of the day, your long-term care insurance is a paid-off house. Literally, it's, it's literally that simple. So what happens is, you know, dealing with this my mom, you know, she's 78 years old. She's you know, not the best of health, man. No other way around that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, did I share this with you all? I, I think I, I'm going to share it again because it's freaking oh. – God is good, my friends. Oh, my goodness. So uh, it's going to make me cry, actually. My mom, um, I talked to her the other day for the first time in for a while, and she was, she was, she has seemed great. It was, I hadn't heard her that good in a long, long time. Anyway, um, she had told me as my brother did, but, my, you know, my mom was in and out of hospitals for many, many years. And, um, and uh, this last time we kind of thought it was going to be it. And then, um, uh, the doc said he got to quit smoking. She'd been smoking like a chimney. She's like 13 years old. And I mean, she's heard all this all before, but she goes, you can't, I, I, you know, you can't keep doing this because they're not going to let you in a freaking long-term care facility if you smoke. Anyway, so she knew that she, uh, you know, things were happening rapidly. And, um, you know, she, uh, she just happened to say a prayer. And she's, uh, you know, she's, she's, she believes in God. She has a relationship, but she's not like you would never think she's a religious person, but she has a belief um, in a supernatural uh, Christian God. But anyway, uh, apparently she had a <laughs> God says, I I'm taking away your need to have cigarettes or something like that. Like literally said to her, the Holy Spirit, probably. But be as it is, uh, someone said, you, you, you don't you I absolve you of your need to have cigarettes. and um, and she hasn't, that was four months ago. She hasn't smoked since. And she goes, I haven't desired one. And my brother, you know, I, my mom was, let's just put it this way. We're like, yeah, I don't know, man. It seems kind of far-fetched. My brother, he went and visited her out of their house in Virginia. And she goes, not a freaking cigarette around. Didn't smell like cigarettes. There's no indication at all of smoking. And I said, you don't think she hid it from me? Because I, she goes, maybe, but I don't think so. I don't think so. And I, uh. It's and this the frustrating thing about being a Christian because you know the reason that Christianity is a, a just grown to the size that it is from 
you know, some hillbilly and, you know, freaking from our equivalent of West Virginia, who's a freaking carpenter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The reason it's grown isn't because the, the arguments we make are so doggone convincing, you know, Paul, we love Paul. We love the stories, but certainly the, the, the proponents of Jesus are, are the worst for the church. Look at Ravi Zacharias, for heaven's sake, the Catholic priest. Hell, man, my wife's dad, when he, uh, I, I can't remember the whole story, but I, I think his mom got knocked up by a drunken Irishman, literally a drunken Irishman who, I'm butchering this, but did he say he was going to move in with her when he, I can't remember what happened, in New York City. And he never showed, he never did what he was supposed to do. And I can't remember, he's literally drunk in Irish. And, um, and he left, and I can't remember what, but she can afford him. And so when you're Catholic, you don't abort. You couldn't really abort back then anyway, but, you know, the Catholics don't abort. And anyway, so she said, I have to, I'll give up my kids to an orphanage, Catholic orphanage in the Bronx. And my brother's, my, my wife's dad's younger brother kept piss, kept wet in the bed and uh, and the Catholic priests in there were so angry, and they held him, my wife's dad, accountable. They kicked him in the ribs and broke his ribs. Catholic nuns did that. That and yet he was a devout Catholic. I don't know if it's like they friggin' Stockholm syndrome. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> It's the people who who uh, advocate for Jesus are the biggest enemies of the the kingdom of Jesus. That's for doggone sure. But anyway, point being is that it's these personal relationships people have with Jesus that is why the the Christian religion is is just as strong today as it ever will be, because the personal relationships can't be defeated. It can't be, man. It can't. I mean, you still get you know, I, hell, I still sin all the time, like a freaking idiot. I still get frustrated, I'm like you know, but. The personal relationship, when you have these feelings, like my mom, did, I've had one before, and I, I won't get to it now, but I've had that. I said, I know that's God talking to me, and that will never be denied, you know, and they'll never be defeated, it'll never be taken away, and as such, I always know that I will be held to my, uh, I'll be held accountable for what I've done, without question. And it's uh, it's one of the amazing things about Christianity that our, <laughs> the people who spread the faith are the biggest, the just the most worst. I apologist, if you will, but certainly not the worst salesman ever. Uh, we're the antithesis of good salesmen, and yet the faith grows. Why is that? Well, because that's what God deems, and if God deems it, it comes to the truth. It's a wonderful thing. Now, what I always hear by people say, "Well, how come I haven't had that?" I don't know. I don't know why other people haven't had their own, you know, personal experience with the Holy Spirit. Um, or, you know, maybe Jesus, uh, God Himself. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, that, that's the, the, the odd thing is you know, how come, you know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, some people are literally on death's door and, uh, about to, you know, take themselves and then they have a, uh, just a reawakening, uh, you know, being reborn by the, the, the glory of God. And some people don't, I don't know why that happens. It's sad. And we'll never know. You know, when you think about with God, his glory is so vast for us to understand God. How arrogant do you have to be, man? It's like how arrogant, how arrogant do you have to be to sit there and say, by the end of 2030, we're all going to die from climate change. I mean, it's so flipping stupid. How much energy is in a freaking hurricane, AOC? I mean, give me a freaking break. You know how much energy is in a hurricane? <laughs> you think we can? Oh, my goodness. It's not the arrogance of humanity, but the arrogance of you. Like, I want to know what God's doing. God's like, dude, you, you realize how big I am? Do you realize how vast? Maybe that's, I do think. So I've been opening up the good book. And again, I go to the ICR, the Institute for Creation Research. And uh, and you have to, I'm not a creationist. This is, I'm not. not. I just, I just it, frankly, it doesn't concern me all that much. The young earth. And I, I don't, it doesn't. It's just not something that. That gets me fired up, um, so I don't pay a whole lot of mind to that. I do like the I, I do like the thoughts of Big Bang and the primordial soup, which is just seems silly to me. There was nothing, nothing out there. Then out of sudden, this on a speck of paper that even if you could not see, you could put that you can't even see it. All this happened. It just <laughs> and we have proof. We can't replicate it. We can't replicate, but we have proof. Scientific method proves it. Okay. 
maybe, I don't know, but I'm just sitting there thinking the idea that, and then all of a sudden you had primordial soup and lightning struck or something happened. All of a sudden life came from nothing. Huh. Seems interesting. It's definitely worth thinking about, but to sit there and say it's been proven by Richard Dawkins or what's that guy's name, the podcaster, the popular podcaster, the freaking atheist guy that everyone loves. Richard Dawkins and the other guy. He's a podcast. A freaking uh uh Sam Harris, that's who it is. Uh I've had many experiences of God's touch. Not gonna explain it here in chat though. Sorry. That's all right, man. Uh Sam Harris, yeah, that's it. Well, I think it's uh, it is Jake. The Green Movement is absolutely absolute religion, absolutely false one. I do think as you get older, I think some there's some actually research on that that older people tend to get less just more relaxed. I do think there's a subset of society of older people that get more fired up, man. Because uh, not not Christopher Hitchens, Lynn. Um, I was talking about Sam Harris. That's who it was. Um, there's a subset of older people who get more and more bitter. And I, I'm not sure if that's the oncoming uh, dementia. I think a lot of it actually has to do with men in particular who retire from something as opposed to retiring to something. And they retire to something um, or they retire from their capital job. They got a million bucks. Like I'm good. And then they end up watching too much political stuff. And that's just not good, man. It's not good. I, I, I tell you, man, you know, opening up the good book is is a, a wonderful mechanism for just relaxation. It really is. Um, it, it, I mean, it takes a good apologist uh, to help you. I, for me, to guide guide you, it really does. And so that's why I use these days of praise from the Institute for Creation Research because it's uh, I forgot the dude's name. I think he's died, but his son or grandson is on there. Uh, and then you got this stuff from C.S. Lewis, Nuggets of Wisdom, an in interview with John Lennox. Um, there's all kinds of good stuff, but I don't have my instant data praise thing here. Anyway, I got out in the other room. It's just, you know, a, a one page every day, one page. It just gets you thinking, man. It gets you thinking about stuff. It's freaking awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. I don't know why I had neglected that. Well, I think I do. So I think I put political, like Harry was saying, politics is a religion. I think I put that before my, uh, my reading of, uh, of God and that's not good. All right. Uh, um, I, yeah, I don't, I, he never did much for me. It's like him and Ben Shapiro. I, you know, everyone says, well, Ben Shapiro, I, I don't know. They just don't do much for me, uh, Tim or Tim. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Not my, I look, I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know enough to give a, a thing, but I've heard a couple of things. Sorry, Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, I just, I'm not a fan of. He just, I don't get why the popularity for that guy is weird to me, but hey, it's all good. Um, so my man Vinyl says there's a lot of kooky people here. Vinyl, but I saw the comment before that. He says, uh, I live in a retirement community. Uh, however you were when you're young, you get worse, man. Yeah, right on. You can't say the West. Man, I, that's sick, puppy. I, I know you're new here. You said that's 100% right, brother or a lady. You can't. The world does, if the world doesn't want to be saved, no matter what you do, we'll, we'll save it. It's, uh, it's very interesting, actually. You know, that's one of the things I've uh, – I've, I've, as I grow older into my fi I'm 50, I said, you know, at the end of the day, you can bring a horse to water, but can't make him drink. It's that simple. And, you know, people, they, they just are going to believe what they're going to believe. And, uh, I think, I still think the one good thing is to, I don't think you hide from debate. That's the thing. I think there is, cause I'm telling you watching comments and back and forth on various you know forums and stuff has literally opened my eyes to a lot of things I was ignorant of previously. And uh, so don't be afraid to engage. Don't be a dick, but just engage in a way that's that's opening. And, and the hostility that you receive, don't be hostile with hostile. Mock is always a good – I try to mock. Mocking is always good. But don't pay back hostility with hostility because that, that doesn't look good. What I'm telling you because there's so many people out there who won't engage, won't engage. I get all the time. But I'm always on your live streams. I just never comment. So those people are always in the comments, but they're never posting anything, but they're seeing what's going on. And when you say, you know, I don't think uh, CO2 is going to kill us all. And the, the level of vit vitriosity is that comes towards you for that. They think that looks good. It makes them look, it, it, 
it makes them look clownish. And as such, people say, why are they so mad? Why are they so angry? The guy's just saying, he, and here's his reasoning, because his reason, his logic makes sense. And they just come back with just freaking doomsday crap and names calling. It's crazy, man. All right, my friends, I think I'm done here. Uh, right on, sick puppy. Appreciate it. Uh, why are interest rates? All right, so we'll end with this. Um, yeah, I think I heard that. I think Shapiro's a never Trumper. And I don't trust never Trumpers. I just don't. So maybe that's what it is. But I, I just, the guy's voice, hey, yeah, look, I'm sure he's a nice guy. He just he doesn't do much for me, man. Um, you know, I don't trust never Trumpers. Like, I don't trust anti Second Amendment people. Or, or let's say, People who are willing to negotiate the Second Amendment, I don't trust them. I would, if, if some of you guys are going to be offended by this, I don't trust any governor that mask mandates. None. Craig Abbott, Doug Ducey, none of them. If you had a mandate on a mask, I don't, I, I don't trust you. Especially if you did it the latter part of the stage of the. If, look, if you did it at the very beginning, where everyone's saying there's going to be millions of deaths in the street, I don't. You should have done that. That's that's idiotic. But. I kind of get that. Um, but if you did it like uh, what's the name did Abbott and Ducey did in the latter part of summer? No, no, no. You were doing it because you couldn't take the political heat, man. That's all that you're doing it. And if you're going to be a I, – I don't trust them. I don't trust anyone who's willing to negotiate the Second Amendment. Um, and while I'm, you know, I'm pretty pro-life, that's not my number one issue. I don't trust anyone who sits there as like waffles on – well, I'm pro-life, but, you know, in these very, it's like, look, dude, just uh, just say what you are and let the chips fall where they may. I don't trust politicians who throw in with BLM. Nikki Haley, nope, 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 nope. Don't trust her as far as I can kick her. Uh, don't trust, uh, who's some of the other ones out there um, on the right? There's other ones on the right. I don't trust, you know, they, they seem like they might be uh, – you know, uh, yes, I still don't trust Lindsey Graham. That's for sure. It seems like he might be a little bit better, but I'll trust him. Not that big on Tim Scott. Those three in South Carolina concern me, actually. I don't. I'm not a big fan of all any of those guys. Um, seems like I'm missing one other guy there. Yeah, I can't remember. But anyway, um, yeah. No, I, I agree. All right, so let's go. Why do I? What do I think? Interest rates are going up. Uh, well, Rubio, yeah, uh, don't trust. No, no, ho, 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 no, no. I like Rand Paul, just he can't, uh, he's he just doesn't have the, I don't think he's got the, he doesn't have his, his dad's fire, if that makes sense. And, uh, you know, that might be good in the national scheme of things, but I just don't see him getting a, uh, a large presence. I like Thomas Massey, I like him, he's from Kentucky too, if memory serves. All right, so uh, I want to go back to uh, why do I think interest rates could go up? I thought I saw that. Uh, right here. All right, so James says, why are interest rates going up? Um, I, I, I don't know that would be true, frankly, but they are. Um, they have. So uh, let me put it this way. Um, interest rates have just got back. So it is daylight savings? Okay. I'm just that text the beautiful. Um, uh, so, uh, oh yeah, so that's what we're to look at. So the ten-year Treasury is just literally back to where it was. Um, uh, January of 2020. All right, so so a year ago, well, you know, what, 15 months ago is, and then we've had. Uh, so here's a chart of the ten-year Treasury, and this is what we're looking at right here. Oops. Let's just turn this guy off real quick. There we go. So this is right there. As the so you can see when it fell. I'm having a hard time with this here. Right there is one of the COVID right there. Now it's just come back to where we were pre-COVID. That seems to make sense to me. I, I don't think it's going up a whole lot more than that. I mean, maybe it'll go to two, but I mean look at that. We're just we're just giving back to where we were you know, pre-COVID. So I don't I mean that just makes sense. I don't think it's like, oh, my goodness, inflation. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's going to be freaking three, uh, what's that, $10 bread lines. Ah, I don't think that at all. And, I, again, until someone can say why Japan is accepted, is, has, the, has the, 
the key, why they just got to answer Japan, just answer Japan. And they're, they're always going to say the same thing. Well, their demographics are different than ours. They don't accept inflate and immigration. All right. Well, the demographics are different. Yes. They're older. Yes. Um, and we don't, and they don't accept immigration. Yes. Those are all positive. Right. We are still an old dying off population. We're not having enough babies. Uh, immigrants are slowly not coming here that much because the job market is becoming worse and worse and worse because of the lockdowns. Um, and just even immigrant countries aren't having that many kids. We know that for a fact. I mean, the immigrants, just because they're coming here from Latin America, potentially, doesn't mean they're going to be freaking having 10 babies. It, it's just there's no evidence of that at all. And so, well, Japan buys their own bonds. Hell, what? How much? we don't buy our own bonds? Have you seen who actually holds our bonds? Um you know, this all these things on, you know, uh, uh, what else would it be? Japan is more of a uh, top down command control economy. OK, I, I you know. But that means there would be more inflation because there's less uh, incentive to start businesses to, to, to fight the freaking big conglomerates that are keeping prices high. I mean, don't forget entrepreneurship. The best thing about entrepreneurs is it reduces prices simply because it says you guys are doing it wrong. I can do it cheaper. And make better profits. Anyway, the point being, I, I don't. This whole argument about Japan is exception because of these things, and we won't follow. That. Maybe to a little bit, but there is no inflation in Japan. There is no growth. Int interest rates are still at zero. And it's been like that since 1990. I don't think we're going to be that far removed from that. I don't. All right, I'm going to go to bed. I appreciate you. Well, I'm going to go uh, read my book. I appreciate you guys. We'll see you later. And if uh, appreciate y'all being here. Much obliged. Give me a thumbs up. Thanks, now.